Uh, we're supposed to lecture about recent events. So I guess the Sinkfield Cup. So I put in four of my favorite games that were less than 40 moves. So then we could actually get to all of them. The next major event on the chess calendar is in Bilbao, Spain, and it's the European Team Cup Championship plus tax. And probably of the top 100 players in the world, 85 of them will be there. So it's pretty strong. So for example, I asked Fabiano who was playing on his team, and he said him, Hikaru, uh, and MVL. So that's a good team. Um, and he said, yeah, we'll be one of the top few teams. Then some other team had, had some stronger players. So yeah, tough, it's a tough crowd. <laughs> anyway, it starts in a couple days. Um, the, all the players flew to Bilbao for this event. So that'll be pretty interesting. Okay, I just made a video um, for a website that I won't discuss here uh, on this game um, titled Exciting Draws. This was the most exciting draw of the Sinkfield Cup and it was round one. Sort of like I thought the most interesting game from the US Women's Championship was in round one when Ashritha won this you know, 500 hour game and she won the prize. Okay, so this is the game uh, MVL versus Magnus and he surprised everybody by playing Scotch. And in this position, well bishop e3 is a move, bishop e3 is a move and knight takes c6 is a move. Knight b3 is the old move. What's funny is this move queen e2 which wasn't very popular, was played a few years ago by Magnus, and he beat Etienne Bacro, MVL's teammate and countryman and such. Right, Nick? Right. Yeah, so the fact that MVL plays it against Magnus is pretty funny. Now here, Carlson played, you know, said, excuse me while I whip this out, and played A5. <coughs> and nobody plays A5, everybody castles. Now, of course, you know, Hikaru, said his usual nonsense, that only I know this move and Kasparov knows this move. Okay, but actually Aronian knew the move because he was talking about it and there was a game played in the Ukrainian championship between Elyonov and Volokitin. So everybody knows this move. However, out of 125 games in my database, that was the only time it was played. So you would expect MVL would be very knowledgeable about castles because that's the main move and maybe he would know nothing about a5, when in fact, nothing was further from the truth. MVL really knew a5, which doesn't make any sense because it's only been played once. Okay, now the point of a5 is to play a4. True story. So in the Volokitin game, White played a4, and then Black didn't play a4, because that would be illegal. And MVL played the most testing move, e5. Now a4 is risky due to its losing, because e takes f6 check. So Black Castle and MVL played very quickly. Takes a4. Now knight a5, knight c5, and knight d4 all lose the knight. Knight d2 blocks the bishop, so rookie 8 is stronger. And you would think this is deep preparation by Carlson, and White doesn't know what he's doing when it was almost the reverse. Uh, MVL played instantly every move. So he had analyzed a5 and came up with his own ideas. Okay, and this is all the computer recommended moves. And in this position, Carlson fought for 30 minutes. And Mag uh, MVL had much more time than he started with. He banged out bishop c4 instantly. He prepared this line. Now here the computer gives two moves. Now again, I had a talk with some of my, my homies from Bruges, and they were telling me maybe MVL wasn't using the latest version of Stockfish when he prepared this line, because I have the latest version of Stockfish, who doesn't? And it recommends the move that Carlson played. After 30 minutes of thought, MVL didn't know this move at all and said it wasn't on his computer. So I don't know if he uses Komodo or maybe he forgot. So the two moves the computer gives are Bishop D4, which is I think playable, and the move that Magnus eventually played, which was Knight B4. And we were shocked at night before because Magnus obviously wasn't familiar since he thought 30 minutes. Although he then said he was familiar, but he was trying to remember if it was night before here or later. Well, night before has a lot of threats. And now MVL thought for 25 minutes and took the night. And Black played the obvious move, Julian, D5, attacking the queen on G4. 
and took back his piece. Now, queen h6 threatens mate, which would work against most of the players in this room. However, not against Magnus, who would play queen takes f6, stopping mate. So he castled. Now, if it was white to move, which it's not, white would win with what move? You. Rook either to d1, threatening the queen, and the queen does not have a plethora of squares. So Magnus played b takes c2, making rook d1 look a bit silly. OK, and now black has triple pawns, which as a friend of mine once said are three times as good. OK, also they're pretty good here. OK, and he played knight to d5. Obviously, the knight is taboo because queen h6 and queen g7 mate. Now, in the video that I made earlier after this game was played, I said rook e6 exclam, and it is exclam. And I said the idea of which is after queen h6, we play rook takes f6. Then someone put a comment to my video and said rook takes f6, bishop g5 looks pretty good for white. <laughs> and I was like, yep. Yeah. <laughs> However, the point was after queen h6, black will play queen f8, right. OK, so now MVL thought a while and decided to take all of his opponent's pawns. Seems like a good idea. So he took on c4. And then excellent move was played here by black. Probably only one or two of you remember what he did. Yes? B5. He played b5, the best move. Now, queen takes b5 runs into a lot of stuff, such as c6 or bishop a6. So he didn't do that. Bishop b7. And this always reminds me of one game, although it should remind me of hundreds of games, but I can't remember that much. Um, this reminds me of the last game in the match between Topolov and Anand. They were tied. Anand was black, and he won in a Tartar Cower with this beautiful bishop on b7. So whenever I see that bishop on b7, I really like it. OK, 97 check. Now black has a forced draw which Magnus saw, and he decided to play for a win, which turned out to be a good decision. Black can play rook takes, and then uh, queen to d2, threatening main on g2, and perpetual. And the computer says that's fine play. Not a nice game. But Magnus played for the win. That surprised me, not because Magnus doesn't play for the win, Magnus is way behind on the clock. And since the position's equal anyway, maybe that's not a smart decision, but maybe it is. OK, so queen takes c2. And white is a pawn ahead, although white's knight is sort of trapped. The bishop on b7 is good. e3 is weak, etc. So good compensation for black. Rook a6, attacking the pawn on f6. And now Maxime played, I think, the only mistake, whoa, the only mistake in the game uh, for his side. Uh, computer says after rook to d1, the position is equal. Maxime thought a long time and played rook to c1. And he actually thought the upcoming rook sack, which happened, was winning for him. Um, although that shouldn't have happened. So the upcoming rook sack happened after queen d2, threatening mate. Here, Magnus thought until he had about three minutes left, and he made a mistake. Probably his only mistake of the game. Queen d3 is the best move. The idea is white cannot sacrifice a rook, as he did in the game, because the queen on d3 is defending everything. So now we have to worry about queen takes e3 check. And if uh, white goes into the ending that starts with queen c3, and they trade queens, even though white is uh, a pawn ahead, he's much worse. Black plays rook d6, rook d2. And computer says black's ahead about 0.7. So he may have won, he may have drawn, we'll never know. Unless there's an alternate universe you can go to. Uh, instead, he played queen d2, which is an instant draw. And you'll see why in a few moves. Check, 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 check. And Magnus actually said when he played queen d2, he either overlooked or underestimated this rook sacrifice. Of course, in this position, if there was a black queen on d3, this rook sacrifice just wins for black because he can play f5 in this position. And the queen's on d3, so the game's over. You. Uh, back in the position uh, where black played queen d3, queen d2, black played queen d5. 
queen d3, queen e5, exclam. Uh, we actually looked at this. Yeah, that's right, king g7. We looked at this. Very slowly said, I like that. Yeah, knight g8 would allow tricks, which are for kids. Yeah, I think after king g7, you're actually lost. Queen f1 mate, with advantage. That is pretty good, yeah. Yeah. No, this was a, we, act, we looked at this. Yeah, computer said no good. Yeah, the knight's dominated. Yeah. And anyway, Magnus had very little time on his clock, so would have been risky anyway. Now, this is funny. Magnus thought he was winning, didn't see the rook sack. MVL saw the rook sack and thought it was winning, but they're both wrong. So that's the best players in the world we got. Okay, and now everything is perpetual. Every legal move for both sides leads to perpetual. It's not like, oh no, perpetual you lose. Like it's all, it's all perpetual. Yeah. Yeah, here black, every move is perpetual here. Yeah. And here white thought a long time, but queen f5 is also perpetual. Everything's perpetual, doesn't matter. Yeah. Every move was all zeros. And then they repeated making it easy for the crowd. Yeah. So both sides thought they were winning, so a draw was a fair result. But that was great play from both sides, especially Magnus, who was faced with something he didn't know and basically played perfect and missed queen d3 with winning chances. So, but, but pretty good. So my next favorite game was the game Magnus lost to Fabiano in round two, three, four. Who knows? It was so long ago. Three. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Okay, bishop's opening. Very suspicious, but okay. Yeah. C6 is one of the main lines. And bishop b4 check is a little nuanced. You want white to play c3, so he can't play knight c3, which would be illegal. And that's what happened. So now white's not going to play knight c3, but okay, white gains a tempo. Problem is, if white plays knight c3, he's putting pressure on d5. So now he's not going to do that. Okay, but this is about equal. In fact, this is really equal. And it was so equal that Magnus, knowing that Fabiano had a good start, 2-0, he wanted it to not be equal and get some action going. So he played very um, um, enterprising. That's the right word. Yeah. And in this position, he played a move that you know very few players would consider. He played h3, put it in h. And Fabiano's like, all right, two bishops and a better pawn structure. Although black has to be careful because white has threats. Threats that Fabiano did not believe existed. Correctly so. He played knight c5. And okay, if white doesn't do anything and plays something boring like bishop to c2, I mean, he's just worse. Black has two bishops. Bishop f7, though, although very tricky, doesn't work. And I think if I had the white pieces and somehow I had this position, I would also play bishop f7 because after bishop c2, I know I'm worse. Um, after bishop f7, I'm confused. Confused seems better than worse. I have a question. Question. So after king takes, um, what's this play? Yep. So in the game, he played knight takes d5 check afterwards, but I think that uh, knight g5 is stronger. And why do you think that? Because the bishop is too strong on the diagonal. I, I agree that I thought that that helped black. Yeah, I agree. I think it's, they're both bad for white, but I think taking on e5 does strengthen the bishop on c7. So I can't disagree with you. That was a great question. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't really a question. He was like, this is better. He was like, Magnus is terrible. Why don't you play my move? Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think both moves are good for black. But yeah, maybe your move is better. Queen g5 is the best. And bishop g4, I think, also is the best or one of the best. Now, the players always give funny comments after the game before they've had a chance to talk to the computer or their coaches about the game. And what Magnus said about this game was quite funny. These moves are all reasonable. He said, oh, knight d3, that's genius, and I didn't see it. Well, he didn't see it. And it is genius, but it's not necessarily the best move. 
but it worked out pretty well because Magnus didn't expect it. Other moves also give Black the advantage, possibly a bigger advantage. But knight d3 plays for mate. Um, Black has lots of pieces attacking White's king, and with the knight on d3 added, it makes it more dangerous for White. So if White plays, for example, rook takes rook, queen e3 check, and queen takes g3, and knight f2 check, is all winning for Black. So he took the knight, and this position is, is obviously terrible. Now here, I mean, material is equal, but okay, white has two isolated pawns, white's king is terrible. So here, white didn't put up the best resistance, and in my opinion, this wasn't Magnus's best tournament, not just score-wise, but a lot of the games, he really didn't play like himself. When he was losing, he'd lose without a fight. When he was much better, he would draw without trying to win. I mean, he tried to win, he just couldn't. So there were a lot of instances in this event where Magnus didn't play like himself. If you were here last year and you were, he just played much better. This was one of those such games. Here, White's much worse, but you would expect Magnus to just play perfectly and draw somehow instead of lose instantly. Okay, so it wasn't the Magnus we're used to. E6, not a good move. Queen G4 is a great move. And it's funny, after Queen D6, Fabiano actually say he started to get nervous until he saw the Queen H5 to E8 idea, then he realized that this was probably winning. Check here. Yeah. And um, yeah, after queen h5, Magnus said, I knew knight h2 lost. And then I looked at queen h2 and I'm like, that's terrible. Let's play something else. Ah, knight h2. <laughs> okay. Uh, Ken West is rolling over in his car or something. You know? He's probably because it's raining outside. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is, a, this, is, this is a Ken West story if I've ever heard one. Ken West, uh, grandmaster here at the chess club. If, if you threaten a, a mate, for example, he will stop it, then his next move will allow it. Because he already stopped it. So, you know, why should I keep stopping it? I heard this story from Ken many times. This is a very similar story. I know knight h2 is bad. Let's play queen h2. Nah, queen h2 is bad. Let's play, ah, knight h2. Okay, he just like forgot. Now, queen h2 is terrible, I admit. I mean, the position's terrible. Because after queen e8, and black will round up this pawn, you know, it's just it's terrible. B black is threatening rook h5 with advantage. And when I say with advantage, I ain't kidding. And so if you stop rook h5 with the move g4, which I believe the computer says is forced, queen takes e7, that's not good. He's going to lose anyway. So he didn't like that, so he played a move that lost instantly. Knight h2. And this reminded me of something that nobody pointed out, but I'll point it out now because you're taping me. In the match, Carlson and Anand from last year, there was a game where Carlson was making a queen and Anand was mating him, and then Carlson made a queen. And there was some position where black, I'm sorry, white, which was Anand, had two pieces that could go to the same square, and he played the one that lost instantly. That reminded me of this. Bishop f1 and knight f1, and he made the wrong one, right? Then he resigned. This reminded me of that, because this was queen h2 or knight h2. Man, was knight h2 bad. Okay, if you thought you were bad, knight h2. Now, after, now what's funny is, Carlson thought he was winning when he played knight h2, because he forgot about rook d1. In which case, white's winning. Because if you play the obvious rook e5, which looks like it wins for black, he saw g4. And now the queen has to defend e8 and e5, a difficult task. So he was like, oh, I'm winning. I'm the best. Then after rook d1, he said, man, I'm the worst. OK, so now, yeah, now you lose everything. Yeah. OK, and he resigned because you lose all your pieces. So that was a very un-Magnus-like performance. Frankly, terrible. OK, but Caruana played pretty well, especially with black and facing fg, bishop takes f7 check. Probably the fans were rooting for white. They want bishop f7 to work. Okay, but no, don't, don't work. Yeah, I hate when that happens. 
So I like that game quite a bit. This game I like because MVL was white and he won a game. Okay, amazing. Now this game was very strange from Levon's point of view because he did something that we were sure he would not do. And it was in this position. Okay, this position has occurred many times. In fact, it occurred in a world championship match between Botvinnik and Tall. Botvinnik played knight a6. Oh, I thought I was bad. And Tall you know, tore him up, because that's terrible. Okay, if you thought Botvinnik was bad, takes. Now, after the game, MVL, who also plays this way with black, he plays Grunfeld type positions. He said, well, here I just play knight e4 and bishop f5 and knight bd7 and it's equal. So he thinks black is fine here. And here, after you take, white plays the obvious knight g5, which is played often in these positions. And in this position, Alejandro, my co-host, said there's no way he'll play c takes b3 and, and totally destroy his position. So of course, after thinking a long time, he played c takes b3. In fact, <laughs> What's funny was Alejandro had to go give an interview outside with Fox Sports and he left in this position and he said anybody who takes on B3 should have their Grandmaster title taken away. Then when he came back, C takes B3 had been played. Okay, yeah, and, and this is just terrible. And uh, again, the players always say strange things after the game. Orion's like, oh, I didn't see Queen E3, what a strong move. Okay, Queen E3 is a good move. Computer also likes queen b4 quite a bit with the same kind of idea, attacking every pawn. Okay, so white has two bishops and black has many, many, many weak pawns and white has a better center. Okay, so queen e3, white wants to play queen takes e6 check and queen takes b3 and a takes b3. Okay, so he takes again and queen takes a2. So black is a pawn ahead but black has the worst position ever. Okay, terrible. And he, he played badly to boot. So the problem is, often d5 is coming, especially when white's rook is on d1, and black doesn't have any active play. White can move forward. White can put tremendous pressure on the b7 pawn, and it can't really move, because then c6 is weak. So it's just, just not a good position. The rook on a8 can't move because the a pawn's hanging. So long term is very bad. He played rook f5, not a good move. You, um, incorrect. Yeah, probably, but uh, why does bishop takes d4? Yeah. Well, by doing no analysis, I would say rook a d1. That's illegal. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> legal moves only. Yeah, your bishop's pinned twice and three times on Saturday, four times on Sunday. Okay, so maybe he didn't play the best moves, but they were legal. So you gotta give him some credit, unlike Randy Singfield. Okay, so rook f5, rook fb1, reminded me of a nice game that I beat Jennifer Shahadi a long time ago, where my rooks were also on a1 and b1. Queen b6, which I thought was just a terrible move, putting the queen on, queen on the worst possible square. Now, a lot of times, these top players play bad moves, not because like they look bad, they have no understanding, it's because they calculated really far ahead, but they missed something. And if their calculation was correct, then their move's great. So without calculating, that looks terrible, but Aronian said, thought here, 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 but he was wrong. Not a good tournament. Sorry? D5 is actually a very strong move, sacrificing the F pawn. But he played E4, which is also winning. And bishop C3, and the queen has to go back. Terrible. Yeah, queen B2. Duh. Okay, and this is like a Morphe game because black's not, you know, getting out his queen side. It's like Morphe's white. And his opponent's like queen B6 to C7, rook F5 to F8. And all the players of today make fun of Morphe's opponents, but look how they play. Same way. Okay, b6. D e5 is good. d5 is good. Everything's good. And e5. Terrible. And there was a really funny variation 
I wish I could remember it where, yeah, I think it's, I think it's knight d7, d6, takes, bishop d5, check. Yeah, I think that was it. Knight d7, exclam, d6, bishop d5. And then white's better. Because white's really better. Man, it's better than better. Okay, so he didn't do that. He played a5, which is terrible. Yeah, and okay, black you know, is just losing material. I was shocked that black didn't resign until he did. Because, man, you're getting beat. It's embarrassing. Okay, and he just played on, I guess, you know, so the game would last a little longer. But, okay. I mean, black can't do anything. And there was a nice variation here, actually, but it didn't happen. Yeah. Right, and now um, if you play king h6, I think he resigned here. Yeah, king h6, the only legal move. And okay, no stalemate tricks. So I thought that was quite a nice game because white just sort of did this. And usually you don't do that against the players like that in this tournament. Not like that. Yeah. Okay, in the last game in the lecture, Karawan Atopilov, this was one of my three favorite games. And the, the, the preparation is very strange to me. So if I prepare, let's say I'm playing Julian, and I know what he's going to do, and I prepare, and then that night it happens and I play it. Okay, that'd be good. But if I prepare for Julian, let's say a King's Indian, and then he does something else, and then I played Julian a year later. I don't remember what I prepared. Okay. Don't even remember that I played him a year ago. And what's funny about this game is Topolov played a line he does not play. And Fabiano was just playing those moves fast. And, play, and Topolov played a novelty. And his opponent, Caruana, insta-moved. And I was like, what? And he said, oh, yeah, that's the first line given by Stockfish. You know, it's a novelty, so I looked at it. When did you look at it? Last year when I was playing Sviddler. And I'm like, what? You remember that? <laughs> okay, so he prepared this for Sviddler. Sviddler didn't do this, but he remembered their analysis even though it wasn't theory. So that would teach Chopolov. So they played a, like, Taimanov con Sicilian. Don't ask me. A6. I guess A, what, Queen C? I guess they're both the Taimanov, the Knights on C6. Yeah, oh, they all transpose. Okay, and, well, Topolov never plays this. So I don't think Caruana is ready for this, but Svidler does play this, and he's played Svidler. And this has all been played before. And King F8. Okay, black can also play G6. In fact, G6 is played more often. Knight A4 to play C4. And Queen A5. Queen A5 has never been played before. Novelty by Topolov. And not only did Caruana move instantly, the, the move's not given by Stockfish. Yeah. And he's like, oh, no, we analyze a lot of moves. This is the move we thought was the best. Okay. So he played rookie too, because the rook's attacked. Good, good idea. And now the queen on a5 is a little iffy unless you trade queens, which is computer recommended. But Caruana laughed and said, ridiculous. Much better for white. Computer's stupid. <laughs> so he was, he was all ready for that. So h5 g5, and the knight's hanging on a4 if you move your queen to some square where it's not defending the knight. So bishop to d2. And Topolov went into a big think, and this is still the pregame preparation of Caruana from a year ago against Siddler. And he was like, yeah, computer says pawn takes queen, bishop takes queen is equal, but that's terrible for black. And then he showed, he showed us why it was terrible and computer's wrong. So that's good prep. You play a novelty, and your opponents looked at it and refuted the computer moves. Man, it's, and after rookie two, Topolov fought forever. So he played novelty and didn't know rookie two. So incredible preparation. And the way the game went, I don't understand why you wouldn't trade queens with black because with the queens on the board, black's king is very suspicious. So he should just trade queens and go into the equal end game that Carter wanted doesn't think is equal. Okay, so queen c7, and now our queen can move away from our knight on a4 because our knight on a4 is no longer attacked. 
H4, which I don't think is a good move. Rook G8, which I also don't think is a good move. And here, basically, black can't do anything. Uh, E5 is protected, and king is on F8. Now, if we go back a move, black can also play knight takes E5, rook takes E5, bishop C3, which at first looks resignable because you're losing your rook on, F8, on H8. But actually, the computer goes further. If I remember, this was a week ago, and I can't remember. Car one remembers a year ago. And then F6, yeah. And the computer likes white, but maybe, well, OK, I don't think the Super Gems would agree with me, but maybe this is better than what he did. You, young man. Yeah, uh, they had this set across, across the tree uh, with R and like, you know, mm -hmm. like 96 here, and like, so completely winning. Well, winning and completely winning are two different things. That would be maybe winning, but completely winning. Now you're, now you're talking crazy. OK, so instead he played rook g8, defending g, g5. Now knight e5 is possible, although not now. And this is actually quite funny. In this position, when I was doing analysis with uh, Al Alejandro, I didn't want to say his name, but I guess I have to. White played rook e3, preventing knight c6. And my commentary at the time was, black will play knight c6, and then later in the press conference say he overlooked rook f6. And Alejandro's like, well, rook e3 stops knight c6, so he won't play it. And then, of course, he played knight c6. So the one time I was right. Black should play some crazy move like king g7, and then you know put his king on the king side where it's safe. Yeah, but okay. Black's position is terrible. Worst pawn structure. King isn't good. Bishop on e7 can't move, and his opponent's about to win seven in a row. How do you deal with all that? Well, he just came from d7, so that would be an admission of failure. Knight c6, though. Then when the knight goes to d4, you're all set. Of course, in this position, if you play the obvious, you know, king to g7, then rook f6 is winning. And I think you could play queen e6 and then rook f6 might be more winning. And the idea is then rook f6. Also good. And there's some, I think the queen on g4 is better because with the queen on g4, there's some positions where you play knight takes and knight e6 check. So you don't want to put the queen there right away. And, and white's threatening queen g5, which is mate. And knight takes c5, and knight takes e6, and OK. White, white's killing it. So yeah, rook e3 basically prevents knight c6, which was played anyway. OK, so he played king e8, which is the best, I guess. Yeah, now this isn't so good. And as I said, my favorite Sopranos line, don't sue me, uh, there's good and there's not good. This is not good. Yeah, Black is a piece up, but it's the worst position ever. He can't do anything. If he plays queen d7, for example, to trade queens, queen f7 is mate. The rook on g8 is threat. In fact, I think the computer said the best move is to let white play queen takes rook check and then king d7. OK, but no human's going to do that, although it's losing. He saved his rook. And now queen h6, which is by far the best move. Not only does it attack the rook, it prepares to play the move e6, which entombs the black king on e8. And then mate is soon to follow. So he gave up his rook. e6, which actually is the best move, but all moves win. And now white's down a lot of material, but white's threatening queen h5 check. White's threatening queen takes rook. White's threatening bishop takes rook. And white's threatening queen h8 check. And basically can't stop any of them. So Topolov played bishop f8 because of the famous rule. Always play bishop f8. Queen h5 check. Bishop takes rook. And here the material is actually in white's favor. And bishop takes g7 loses for a variety of reasons, the best of which is check at e7. And if there was a referee, hey, there was, Chris Bird, the fight would be stopped. White is threatening queen e6 mate. 
rookie six check, e8 equals knight, e8 equals queen, pawn takes rook equals anything, and uh, king g2, solid. Yeah, okay. King g2 is a Solid, yeah. So after bishop takes g7, black resigned. So it's funny, like, when you guys play, like, h5, g5, h4, then you get made, you're like, ah, why'd I do that? But even Topolov does it. Pushes all the pawns on the king's side, and his king's open. Who would have thought that? And Topolov had the, the chance to trade queens after pushing all the pawns in front of his king, and he didn't. Strange decision to me, because his king was, was, was not good. Well, sometimes when you push all your pawns, you get a big attack, but sometimes you just open your king, which is what Topolov did in a couple of games. On the other hand, Topolov won some games too. Okay, unlike certain other people who we won't mention. But, so playing like for a draw every game or boring or not exciting, you still might not win any games. And if you push all your pawns in front of your king and you lose, you look terrible. But if you win, like in the game MVL versus <sighs> Ding Liren? What was the game where he pushed all his pawns every move? I think that was Ding Liren. You know, from a couple years ago. His, every move was a pawn push. Didn't move his pieces out. Yeah. Yeah, it looks good when it works. When it doesn't work, then you're like, man, you don't have any puns in front of your king. What are you doing? So double-edged, of course. That's the kind of game Topolov likes. Probably not to Karawan is liking so much. I think he likes to just outplay you slowly. But okay, if you're going to get mated, he'll mate you. And that's why I think Karawan is a good player. He has a style, but when he plays against his style by sacrificing or running with the kings around, like you saw with Carlson, where his king was running around and Carlson was trying to mate him, and then Carlson got mated. I mean, he can still play those positions well. So it's good to have a style, but it's also good to play all positions well. Those were four of my favorite games that were relatively short. Uh, probably my favorite game from the event overall was the game Caruana beat Aronian uh, when Caruana was white. And he just sort of outplayed him and beat him. It wasn't like opening prep and he was winning right away. Uh, this game was a lot of it was opening prep, <clears throat> but even after the opening prep, it was complicated. He just outplayed his opponent. And I think Fabiano has sort of a mix of good prep and then good play afterwards. Uh, by far the best opening prep of the tournament, but probably also the fewest mistakes. And I think he could have scored more points. I think he could have got nine or nine and a half, but a paltry eight and a half out of 10. Frankly, depressing. No. Um, and okay, Carlson didn't have his best tournament. Probably if he had a good tournament, he'd score plus three or four. So he'd still lose by two points. I mean, he didn't lose that many rating points either. Now, other players, Topolov had a normal tournament, came in third, and he played sort of up and down like this game. And I'm sure Hikaru and Laroni want to forget their tournament. And this was MVL's first tournament where the average rating was over 2750. In fact, it was over 2800. So he got minus two, he basically, I had these funny discussions with FIDE Master V. Friedman. I said, if you told me before the tournament, MVL gets two draws against Carlson and beats Aroni in one and a half half, probably he'd be pretty happy about it. And maybe he was. But minus two is his overall score, um, basically getting crushed both games by Caruana and then splitting with the rest of the field. So you can't really complain too much since this was his first you know, big dance. But uh, for those of you who don't know, there was a lot of play after the tournament, bug house and silly chess, silly analysis between all the players. And based on what I heard from my homies in Bruges, Aronian's the best bug house player, MVL second, and Yasser was third. That's what I heard. So we had some interesting bug house uh, play at this tournament afterwards. Um, and the players were playing blitz and sort of acting silly. So <coughs> when the tournament's over, they have more fun. On the tennis courts, MVL lost a couple of matches, but what are you going to do? He'll get better next year. So hopefully we'll have eight players next year, and that means the commentators get paid more because more work. That's why I'm hoping for that. Uh, and uh, what's that? Can we take a look at the game uh, where MVL beat Carwana in round seven? Where MVL beat Carwana in round seven? Oh, well, somebody has a bad memory. Yeah, yeah. yeah. terrible, terrible memory. <laughs> Boy. That the lower age you are, you sir. What, what he's saying is. It's yeah, I know what he's saying. <laughs> Thanks for translating from the Russian. Yeah, right. 
So in any case, uh, those were the best games from the tournament. And this is the best video you're ever going to see. I mean, I mean, there's the greatest players, there's the greatest commentators, and then there's me. So we'll see you next time here from the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of St. Louis. I'm out. Mm -hmm.